Well, let's let's go ahead before we get any further. Discuss the elephant in the room. Yeah. The coronavirus. Yeah. Well, our little town's been hit like everybody else has. We've been hit, so uh, everybody's experienced pretty much the same thing. If you live in one of these hot spots, you experience a little bit more than what we're taking on right now. But we all are affected by this, and we're uh, we're gonna get through it. We may have to make some changes. And as I tell people, when this is over with, life's gonna be a little different. So just go ahead and prepare yourself for that. But we're gonna make it through. It has been a stressful time on everybody, including us, everybody out there. And I'm not one to complain. I don't want to complain. We're doing the best we can. However, let me explain to you a couple of things. Uh, our customer service and our reaction time on placing orders to get them out is not what I exactly want it to be. We are doing the very best we can. But us, along with a lot of other companies, have experienced overwhelming orders in the last few weeks, especially in the last two weeks. For some reason, other people feel like they want to be guarding more now than they did before. Some of our competitors have shut down their websites or either have placed uh, some things on their website saying they'll be seven to, t seven to 10 days out on getting orders out. We've always prided ourselves on getting orders out the same day if you place it before three o'clock. That has not been the case in the last week. We've done pretty good, but we have failed on a couple of those uh, days and we are working seven days a week and we're doing the best we can. However, our customer service, our reaction to Facebook posts and our reaction to emails is probably not up to par with what you have get experienced from us in the past. I just wanna let everybody know we are doing the very best we can, but expect some things to be a little different with the situation we're in. Our customer service is not going to be up to the point where it should be and we're aware of that. Let me just say this right here. We are doing the very best we can and that's what we're going to continue to do. I can't guarantee what tomorrow brings. I can only tell you what today brings. We may not be here tomorrow, but we are here today and we're going to work through today and good Lord willing, we're going to be here tomorrow. So that's kind of where we're at. Yes, yeah, so we've got three confirmed cases in our county as of this morning. Albany, which it's, a lot of people have heard about on the news because it's kind of a hot spot. It's only about 30 minutes from my house. There's hundreds of cases there, I think, at this point. Um, regarding the, the orders and the customer service, yeah, seems like a lot of people are wanting to, to garden and, and grow a bigger garden. Uh, there have been some days in the last two weeks where we are getting them out, all the orders before 3 p.m. getting them out. There are some other days where it's just, it's almost impossible, um, even working late into the night. We have brought on additional staff to help us pack seeds. Uh, a lot of people have asked, are we gonna run out of seeds? At this point, it doesn't look like so. Most of our big seed suppliers are still up and running. Uh, it may take me a few days longer to actually get those seeds, but uh, we're still able to buy seeds in bulk and uh, repackage them for you. That's not necessarily the case on hard goods. Hard we goods, we have, we are seeing some of our suppliers and tool uh, makers um, shut down, shut down, or be forced to shut down. And so there will be some. For instance, our digging fork. Um, which is a hot item this time of year. We're, we're probably going to run out of those and be a little bit before we can get some. So there will be some complications there. If we're out of stock on something, you know, we're probably going to be out of stock on it for a little bit. Yeah, in the past, what we have done is we put an uh, item on back order. You could still order it, and when we get it in, we ship it out. It may be a couple, three, four, five days. We only did that if we knew it was going to be a small window of time between we knew something was coming in, something would go out, because we normally had a pretty good feeling of that. Since that has changed and we do not know when we're going to get something in, even though we had it ordered in a particular time frame, we're probably not going to do back orders anymore. When something is out of stock, it will be out of stock and you can't order it because we don't have, have no idea when we can fulfill that. We do have one item on our website that you may have ordered in the last three weeks that we did have on back order, and that is our 15 mil drip irrigation tape or our 15 mil drip irrigation kit. We thought we would get them in before now, be able to fulfill those orders. I did get an update yesterday. This product is supposed, supposed to ship today. No, today's, no, it'd be tomorrow. Tomorrow out of California, so we're expecting to have those in next week if everything goes okay. As soon as we get them in, we'll get those orders out the same day. So that is the only item that I know that we got on back order right now, and we should we should have everything out next week or everything goes according to plan. And as far as the seeds go, 
Uh, I would normally put a priority as far as what I'm getting packed back there. Uh, put a priority on packets over larger pounds. But with this situation, this pandemic, we've seen a lot, a huge influx in orders on pounds and larger packages. So I have been put more of a priority on the pounds. So if you see that the packet's out of stock, a lot of times the pounds may be in stock. So we've been putting a bigger priority on the larger packaging uh, just because we realize people are needing more. They're growing a bigger yep. garden at this time. So um, w with relation to, to that, I do want to mention, so we're not doing a Saturday video this week. We're doing a video tomorrow, which will be Friday. Uh, it's kind of a joint collaboration thing that's been going on all week with the Homesteaders of America. We'll be doing a, a video together, kind of out in the garden. And it's going to, assuming that the, the conference still happens in October, whether it, it, will, it will happen either way, whether it's virtual or, or we'll be there live in person. But we're going to do a talk then about good storage crops for homesteaders. And our video on Friday is going to kind of be a little bit of a teaser uh, for that. We're going to talk about some of the vegetable crops that we think are important to grow during times like these. Speaking of times like these, let me tell you something. It's been stressful around here, and everybody's been stressful. I get that. <clears throat> you know, come 5 o'clock, 5.30, when we normally, 5 o'clock's quitting time right here, I normally get out of the office about 5.30. So what I've been catching myself doing, I've done this for a long time, but I've really appreciated it more in the last week. I go get my dog, my dog's name's Tank, and we go to the garden, and me and Tank stay in that garden till dark. Mm -hmm. I don't carry my phone with me. I leave my phone in the office. But that is a good good time for me to be able to kind of draw decompress. down a little bit, decompress, enjoy myself, and get a perspective on things. And uh, I just wanted to mention that. So the gardening for me has been a huge stress reliever during this, this time right here. And it probably has for other people too. Uh, yeah. And one more thing. Uh, we have t told this to people who have been calling. If you do live nearby, a lot of people like to stop by here and see us. We are uh discouraging any visitors at this time we have pretty affordable uh if not free if you order over 99 dollars affordable shipping rates on the site even if you live right down the road from us we would rather you order online and let us ship it to you we're yeah. trying to keep this situation as contained as possible we're not worried about them shutting us down because we fall under the agricultural umbrella but we're, if, if we were to get infected here we could have some problems well you know if anybody's ever come by here they they know how well we like to carry more tour and spend some time when i do that's one of the things i really enjoy is spending time with people and talking to them and find out more about what they're doing and how we can help them and that kind of thing however these are times where we just cannot afford that and one reason is is we feel really we feel it's really important to protect our employees. So we don't want to care people about there and make them feel uneasy. We want, to, we want them to feel like we're doing as much as we can because we are. So if you are, understand where we're coming from here. It's not, it's not us trying to be rude or thinking we're maybe whatever. It's an issue that we're just trying to do for precautionary reasons for our employees, for our business, for our families, and for yours too. So just help us follow on that. We'd be glad to help you any way we can. We are just asking you not to come into the office or warehouse. And, um, and, and folks who have been following us for a while know this, but we've been plugging away at this thing for about 10 years now. And uh, we, have, we, have, we haven't had any breaks along. We haven't ever had any big news stories written by us or anything. So we... We've kind of been grinding and now things have really picked up, especially since we started carrying seeds and we are super appreciative of everybody that's chosen to use us as their seed source or trying us as their seed source for yep. the first time. And right now during a crisis like this, this is our time to shine. And this is when we want to be here for you. And as long as we can keep doing that, we want to be doing that. And we appreciate everyone's support out there uh, more than you'll ever know. Absolutely. Speaking of one more thing about the virus, uh, on a lighter note, so I was talking to my buddy Jason at Cog Hill and I was saying, you know, I wonder with all this happening, some of the prepper YouTube channels might be coming back out of the woodworks a little bit. Uh, I haven't noticed anything yet, but you know, back in 2010 and even 11 and 12, there was quite a bit, a few prepper channels on the, on the YouTube radar, but once the economy started kicking butt, 
they kind of fell off a little bit and I was wondering if, if some of that might get kind of stirred back up. It will be interesting to see. Yeah, I think it will. And uh, I'm, I've said this earlier now, I think it's really, if you think about what life's going to be different after this is over with. Yeah. We're going to think different. We're going to shop different. We're going to react different. Everything is going to be different when this is over with. Yeah. There's going I don't expect this little gardening bubble that's exploding right now to to be short lived. I think there's going to be a lot more people out there wanting to grow their own food. We're going to realize what's important and what's not important. We're going to be able to prioritize things a little different and our mindset is going to be different. That's right. Another lighter note, so we got some new stickers in and we're throwing these in the orders. Uh, we're throwing them in the mix with all the other ones we showed you uh, several shows ago. So everybody wanted some of the wheel hoes and I'll let you hold one of these. So we've got one with the single wheel hoe, one with the double, and one with the high arch. So if you place an order, there's about a one in, I forget how many stickers we have now, one in eight chance you get one of these and you can collect them all as you uh, place your orders over the year or whatever. And uh, so we got those here and uh, hopefully you get one of those in the mail. Those are, I, I like, I really like this high arch one here. That's probably my favorite. Hmm. Uh, healing some, I think covering up some taters, right? Taters? There. Boy, my taters are looking good, man. I'm not going to talk. I'm going to talk about my taters on video next week. I'm not going to talk about them right now. I don't want. It's kind of a sore subject, would you? It's, it's not a sore subject. I just I, I don't want to. I, I don't want. You just don't want to talk about. It. Well, I'll talk about mine. Mine come <laughs> up, and mine are looking good. I, I pre-planted. I mean, I pre uh, put some fertilizer down, pre-plant. I got everything looking good. I'm going to heal them. I've healed them one time. They're getting right about ready to heal again. But I believe in the last two days they've rooted six inches. Yeah, yeah. They grow them fast. Mine is growing fast too. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not going to get into all mine. I, I'm not, I, just, you just have to wait on the video. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sad or upset or anything, but uh, we'll get there. Uh, I want to show a couple things. First thing, and, and I should have put this in the fridge, just wilted a little bit, but I, because um, I cut it this morning. But this, this pack choy here, folks. Man, in, that's some pretty stuff. In right times there. like these, and I, I talked about this on my last video of how fast this stuff grows. This this transplant hadn't been in the ground but about two weeks, maybe really? two and a half. Now, I, it's in some good soil, good dirt there, and um, these things grow so fast. And in times like these, when you're in a crunch or whatever and you need to produce some food quick like and in a hurry, as we like to say, this one is a great one to go to. And you eat the whole shebang right here. There's nothing wasted here. Now you could direct seed them on a bed. I like to transplant them, but it's amazing how fast these things grow. I mean, an inch or two a day. Like I said, these have been in the ground for two weeks. And you that's, you, they'll get twice as big as this and still good to eat, but you could harvest them like that. And I recommend planting a whole row of them. You can start working on them right now when they're a little small and then as they get bigger and then you eventually eat the whole row. I enjoy, I, no, I'm not a, the biggest fan of eating them. I do like to eat them, but I enjoy growing those because they are so, they, they grow off so well. And they're beautiful. Yep. And I did have a, you know, I would normally have a little bug pressure on these, but I tell you, they grow so fast, I don't think the bugs can keep no. up with them. <laughs> What else we got here? Uh, carrots. So last week I was showing some orange or some of my orange carrots, and uh, after the show aired, or after we shot the show, I got talking to Miss Hoss, and and she made it sound like you might have been fibbing a little bit on how big oh, your now, carrots were. Now. Well, she don't need to be telling no more. <laughs> Me and her got out there and dug into carrots. Because uh, she she said, she said, quote, your daddy's carrots were pitiful. There wasn't much to them. Mm, I have to have a talk. And um, so, and you grew some yellow ones. Now, these are these are not the Yellowstone ones, which I like to grow. This is a rag called Gold Nugget that we got that I grew for the first time this year. And, man, I really, really like this variety. It's got a tinge of green on the top on all it of It does. They get a little bit of sun on them. They yeah, get I that, like that. But you can cut yeah. that off and, and no big deal. But these look more like your Bugs Bunny carrots right here. They got nice broad shoulders on them. Got a sharp taper. And uh, these did really well for me. I, I, I didn't know how well they were going to do because I tried to dig some a little early, but I left them in the ground a few weeks more. And um, I really, really like this variety. Now, it's not a... The Yellowstone is more of an imperator, so it gets a little longer. 
than these do. But these did good, even in that clay soil. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting six, seven inches, some um, eight inches on them. Some of them are a little stubby like that right there. There ain't nothing wrong with that carrot right there. So, uh, although I was doubtful at first, I ended up with a really, really good carrot harvest this year. Tastes like they got a pretty high sugar content also. Mm-hmm. You like them? Yeah, I do. That's a gold nugget. Look at there. Mm-hmm. Now, I may slip up on some other crops, but you rarely, rarely catch me slipping on carrots now. Really? I usually come through on my carrots. We gotta work with you on some more things. Well, what's good is that I'm good at better at growing certain things than you are, and you're better at growing certain other things than we are. We can kind of complement one another, and um, I'm I'm willing to admit my your failures, my shortcomings and huh. failures, uh, as long as you're willing to. What else you got underneath here? So, some, I got some onions, some Texas legend onions that I've been pulling a few of, look at them. Now the tops on these ain't falling over yet. So they still got a little ways to go. Yeah. But we already got some. Now that Texas legend is more of a round bulb. Yeah, like this right here. I mean, let me clean that up a little bit for y'all. Yeah. So, actually Texas legend right here. That one right here is about baseball size. Okay. Is that the biggest you got? I had one that was about softball size. I put a picture on Instagram of that one. Yeah. Uh, it's still sitting at the house. You were scared to bring it? You didn't want to show no, it? No, no. It was just on the counter this morning. And I was at the barn getting stuff uh -huh. together for the show. Yeah, is that right? So uh -huh. I'm sure you're going to want up me. Well, what we got right here is a. So I think this is either. this. I grew this from seed. This is either Savannah Sweet or Sweet Harvest. That's your granix type yep. onion. You flat. Now, I measured this one right here. Folks, that's five inches. Now, this one's not ready to come out of the ground. I had to pull it because I knew Travis was going to have some of his onions in here. And I wanted to kind of give a contrast what's going on right here. Because mm -hmm. he didn't bring his big onion, but I brought one of mine. Because mm -hmm. seeing his belief. Yeah. So what I got here is a five inch onion and this thing is still going to grow some more. This tops is not fell over. These onions are not ready to harvest yet, but you know, it ain't going to be long. Our onion harvest is going to be a little sooner this year than it normally it is. Struck off hot on Struck us. off hot on us and we had a good winter growing climate on. Now I had some blight jump on mine, but I knew I shouldn't overreact and I knew I'd be all right. Now I, I, I grew out of this blight and I'm going to be good. That's a fine onion Man, right there. that's a there. fine onion right there, ain't it? That's a fine And this onion. ain't the biggest one out there. Yeah, I believe you. I believe you. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Uh, that's a nice, nice but green. Good flat thing. onion. See how flat it is? Those, those, I like those flat onions. There's nothing wrong with the round onions, but I like mm -hmm. a good flat onion there. And, and now I'm going to talk about this in a, a future video, so I'm not going to want to give it all away here. But uh, I think in the future, I'm not going to plant any more onion plants. I'm going to do, I'm going to grow all mine from, I'm going to grow all my onion plants. From, and I'll, I'll show you some evidence of this on video. And nothing against my buddies at Dixondale. They got great, great plants. But uh, from what I have seen, the ones I grew out in 338s and put in the ground uh, have, have been a little more resilient and have kicked off a little more. Did I mention that I grew this one from seed? Yep. I didn't mention, I didn't know if I mentioned yep. it or not, you but did. I did. You did. Yep. I grew onion bed of plants and then it I makes did. It makes sense because there's not that stress time from when they're out yeah. of the ground. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it makes sense. And we've grown plenty of good onion crops from those plants we get. But uh, the, now that we have the means to do them, and I can do that in 338s, so I think I'm going to grow all my onion plants from now on. And that Texas legend, that, that's my favorite. It's not the sweetest onion out there, but it stores the best of any of the sweet onions we have found. All right. All right. We forgot to tell everybody who we were. Oh, we did. We done got way too deep in the old. show. Anyway, welcome everybody to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And we're excited to have you with us tonight. We got a good show planned. We're about to talk about sweet corn here in a minute because it's getting that time. If it ain't already that it time. It is that time. I, I'm really ashamed of myself. I ain't got mine planted. I'm going to try to, I got a lot on me. I'm going to try to get it done this I got week. my, my dirt is already. Mine too. And, uh. And I'm going. I'm going to try to plant it in the next few days. 
We I did, did get my hickory plant king planted. Did get your hickory king planted, planted. planted, field corn planted. Now I did uh, on my last video. I asked everybody out there which variety I should plant between the. We got four triple sweets, and we'll talk about those in a minute. You grew the honey select last year. Uh, I'm and I asked everybody should I grow the Avalon, the Providence, or the Primus, and uh, it was a real close run between the Avalon and the Providence. Looks like the Avalon won out. So I'm be growing that white triple sweet. Would you like to help the viewers decide between which the, the Primus or the Providence you want to grow? Yeah, that'd be fine. I don't have a problem with either one. Okay, so y'all comment below and uh, you can decide which other triple sweet he's going to grow, either the Primus or the Providence. Both of those are bicolors. And uh, so I'm going to grow the white one and we'll see how they compare. Yep. Okay, let's get into some sweet corn talk here. And believe it or not, folks, see, I, I recycled these cards. I use this card on the show. Uh, it's still a little dirty, but uh, several, seemed like a year or so ago. We're getting, we, this is episode, believe it or not, it's episode 95 of the 95. Road by Road Show. Getting close to 100. Woo. Okay, so talking about sweet corn, there's a lot, there's a heap of sweet corn varieties out there. And a lot of people got the favorite one that they're growing for years. And a lot of people, like me like to experiment and try new ones and and we're going to talk about kind of the three basic categories and then we're going to talk about the triple sweets and then we'll get into some some growing tips just some kind of uh you know do's and don'ts as far as sweet corn goes so first of all let's talk about the three major types okay and these are defined by the gene type that they have okay so you've got your standard which has the SU gene. These are going to be, and I'll let you show them. I didn't oh, bring, the old time favorite Silver Queen. Silver Queen, which is a white one we have. That, that Everybody has grown Silver Queen at least once, I feel. I like. would say Silver Queen is the most popular of the standard varieties of the sweet corn, in my humble opinion. It seems to be. It seems to be. It's not our most popular variety that we sell, but it's, oh, it's, it's most of the standard. Yeah, it's the standard sold. And I didn't bring, I forgot a pack of the Stoll's Evergreen. That one falls into that category too. Yep. And then we've got the Jubilee here, which is a yellow standard. So these standard ones here, if you like that kind of more starchy corn flavor, um, these are the ones you want to go with. These are going to be less finicky as you get sweeter as you get sweeter your storage ability goes up okay but the germination soil temperature is also going to go up so these standard ones will germinate in cooler soil better than these super sweets will okay so these standard ones here you know, when you harvest these, you better be ready to do something with them pretty quick. In about three days in the fridge, they're going to get starchy on you. So you, you got to kind of be on the ball with these as far as you're going to cream them, you're going to put them on the cob, freeze them, yeah, what you're going to do you with know, them. You know, on the Silver Queen, we've always, when we pulled it, we did something with it. We never did put it in the refrigerator and wait three days. So yeah, I, but if you if you I'm market just, farmer sell it, I, I get that. I'm game. just was thinking about the way we've always done it. When we got ready to put it up, we went out there and we pulled it. We shut. We cut it off right then. Yeah, and that's why a lot of the market farmers and stuff don't grow these because of the storage time. But if you like that old timey corn flavor, those are the ones to go with. And those are gonna. You can plant those earlier because they don't require as warm a soil as some of these. Other I'm gonna go a step further with this. Okay. These don't require as much tending to, or a little easier to grow. Than the than the sugar enhanced and the triple sweets. I would agree. I would agree. They are a little bit more drought resistant. They a can more get forgiving. Especially more forgiving. the Stoll's Evergreen. If you can't got good irrigation, that's a good one to go with. They're a little more forgiving on the fertilizer requirements. They will make in a less than ideal environment where some of these super sweets and triple sweets and sugar enhanced will not. I agree. I agree. Okay. So those are our standards. Let's move on to our sugary. Now, this, I think this SE really stands for sugary extender. I always say sugary enhanced, so if I use those terms interchangeably, just forgive me. So we got the SE gene, which stands for sugary extender or sugary enhanced. And this, this category is where you find a majority of your popular varieties out there. And we've got, excuse me, we've got a heap of them. 
So these are gonna these are gonna store better than your standard ones. These are gonna store in the fridge. I, I sometimes I can get six, seven days out of them. Uh, they're gonna need a little warmer soil temp to germinate than the SUs, and they're gonna be a little sweeter. Okay. So we've got several of these. We've got the Silver King, which is the SE version of Silver Queen, which is a white one. Uh, we've got several yellow ones, Bodacious, which is a really popular one. Incredible sweet corn. Also, peaches and cream. Peaches and cream has been a popular variety for a few years now. A lot of people like that one. Of course, with the name Peaches and Cream. That just sounds not, good. Yeah. Ambrosia. This ambrosia. That's probably grow. our most popular yeah. variety of sweet corn out yeah. there. It's done really well. Done good for us. We grew that in the fall one year. What's the other one you got? Argent. Argent. So Argent's one we just added this year. This is another white uh, SE variety. Yeah. It's pretty popular. Of these ones right here, the ones with the shortest days of maturity is going to be your ambrosia and your incredible right there. Mm -hmm. See what that is. Oh, and bodacious also. Yeah. Yeah. So these three right here is going to be days of maturity around 75 days. Yeah, I've grown both the Ambrosia and the Incredible. So if you're like in one of those it. cool climates or you have a short growing season, you may want to look at some of these. Okay, so those are our SE, our Sugary Enhancer Sugary Extenders. And, and real quick before we go any further, talk about corn color. Uh, corn color is, is just, I have, if you did a blind taste test, you really can't tell a difference. It, it's more personal preference. A lot of people like white corn. A lot of people, the bicolors have become really, really popular over the last few years. Uh, if you're gonna, uh, like the the guy that's always at the fair selling the roasted ears of corn, I like a good yellow ear corn for that purpose. So it, it just depends on what you like. Yeah. Uh, I, I like them all. I can't be. I do too. Partial. I love corn. Ooh, when it first comes in, I boil me a big old pot of it outside underneath the carport there. And I knew about make I knew about make myself sick off of it. Now I, I do know this. Um, you, you, like I said, you got a lot of the old timers that swear by Silver Queen, and they won't they don't want nothing else, won't grow nothing else. Granny's like that. She, I can't convince her to grow any of these others that store a little better, and are sweeter. Now I know some market farmers, and some people might find this dishonest, and uh, it may be a little bit. But what they'll do is they'll grow. A sugary enhancer, either a super sweet or a triple sweet white corn, and they'll tell her they'll sell it as Silver Queen because the folks won't eat it if it ain't Silver Queen, and uh, it's a lot sweeter than Silver Queen. Man, that's some of the best Silver Queen. Yeah, that is. Grown. That's not right. I, don't, <laughs> I agree. That's not right. The last one here uh, is, is the super sweets of the SH2. Now we don't carry any of these. Uh, don't get the out quite yet. Don't show them nobody. I'm so uh, the super sweets. I'm working on getting some super sweets. Uh, I don't know if I'll have them this year. Maybe get some next year. There's one our buddy old Andy Webb likes to grow called Mirai. I think it's M I R A I. Mm -hmm. That he says is really good. Uh, so we're going to get some super sweets. I don't have any right now. Uh, it's hard to get these uh, without some pretty nasty treatments on them. So that's what I'm working on is being able to get them untreated like some of the rest of these corns. But your super sweets are going to store the longest, you know, up to 10 days. Um, they're going to require some pretty war warm soil temps to germinate. Uh, and they're going to take a little more babying, like yeah, you said. They are. So, we covered the three basic ones. Now let's talk about this thing called a triple sweet. Triple sweet. So what does triple sweet mean? Well, a triple sweet corn actually has all three of these genes right here. So on a triple ear of triple sweet corn, you're going to have some of these standard kernels. You're going to have some of these sugar enhanced kernels and some of these SH2 kernels. And that's why the triple sweets have become so popular because you get some sweetness, but you also get some of that old timey corn taste. So the flavor profile would be more robust or be more complex, complex. Or, or yeah, whatever yeah. you want to say. Yeah. Um, the other good thing about it, having all three of these genes, and this is what we were alluding to last week, is you don't have to isolate it. Okay. And I'll tell you, what that means. So if you want to grow two different varieties of sweet corn, this is how you should do it. You should plant your, whichever one of these you're growing, a, a Silver Queen, an Ambrosia, or Super Sweet, plant that one first. Wait about two weeks, then plant you a Triple Sweet. Now, 
That way, this thing is already pollinated by the time that triple sweet comes along and starts making tassels. Now, these things, the first one you planted may still have a little bit of pollen on it out there. And if you grow a triple sweet near SU, you may get a few more SU kernels on that ear. If you grow it near this one, you may get a few more of these kernels on that ear. But for the most part, that triple sweet is going to be true to variety. So that's what we mean when we say it doesn't have to be isolated because it already has all three of your main genes there. And that's what makes the triple sweets nice. So you can grow your silver queen if you like that and swear by it but you can also wait a couple weeks and experiment and try your triple sweet see if you like it or not yep and i'm going to tell you what these people uh these people that did not grow up growing their own food or are used to buying their corn in the grocery store they're going to favor these triple sweets over they are those silver queens because they used to having sweeter corn. they used to having sweeter corn let's talk about the four varieties we got here um the first one there, we got this white one here called Avalon, which is, that's the one Trav will be growing. That Honey Select. Select is what I grew last year. It turned out to be a real good one. Everybody liked it, except for me. And that's the one, if y'all saw that video, he just, he couldn't stand it, so he ate a whole bowl of it on the show. Then we've got the two bicolors. We've got the Providence, and we've got the Primus. That Primus has been our best seller so far. That thing has been hot. I think I might be out of the one pounds on that right now, but I'm getting more in. Uh, that's been a really popular variety. So we got four of those. I don't know why I'm still holding that sign. Four of those triple sweet varieties in there. And um, it, and how would you say, because you grew the honey select last year, did you, would you say they took a little more baby in their effort than oh, the yeah, silver queen? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, if you're going to grow these corns right here, drip takes a necessity. Got to have them on drip. And you got to understand, you don't want to be a beginner growing corn because they take a lot of nitrogen. You really have to put the fertilizer to them. You kind of need some, you need some pre-compost or pre-manure in the soil probably too. You need to understand the fertilizer requirements of, a, of one of these. And, uh, and I'm there. I do understand it. I mm -hmm. know when you get enough air and uh, they need to be nice and dark green the whole way through. If you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of experience, I would not recommend growing one of these. Start off with your silver queen. I have experience with sweet corn before. If you don't have that soil kind of halfway fertile before you plant and that, that corn can't get that nitrogen early, it don't matter how much you pump to it after that, you can't ever get it to catch up. You so never want to starve one of these corns right here. And it's important if you got you some good compost or even some manure to till that in before you plant, it's going to make a world difference on that corn. Because yep. you want it, to, as soon as it's this tall, you want it to be green as a gourd. You know that Hickory King I planted the other day, that's a very forgiving corn. Yeah, it is. Drought tolerant. I mean, it, it, fertilizer's not ticky about that. It's easy to grow. But man, these right here, the, the payoff is big. But. Because you're going to have. Good tasting corn is going to store good for you. I can promise you, all your neighbors and everybody you're going to give it to is going to talk about how great a corn it was, going to give you the big head a little bit. And so if you're a market farmer, if you're selling these on the side of the road, these are the ones to grow yep. right here. Yep. Because uh, you're going to have people coming back and coming back and coming back one yep. more time. Yep. Amen. Amen. If there's any other varieties of sweet corn out there that we don't carry, and I know we, we're growing our we try to double our offering every year uh, that you really recommend we should carry. Put those in the comments below and uh, we'll be glad to kind of look into them. Let's talk about some growing tips, kind of bump through some growing tips. Yeah, we talked corn. about a lot and I had somebody this morning call and said, I plant two rows, 60 foot long corn. That's not the way you plant your corn. You plant your corn in blocks. Corn's pollinated by the wind. You want to plant in squares if you can. If your rows get a little longer and they do wider, deal with it. You may be all right. You want at least three rows. At least three rows. And the bigger, the, the more blockier it is, the better the pollination. If you get those corn cobs at the end of the season that are half filled out, more likely it was due to pollination issues. Everywhere that that uh, tube comes down, it goes to a kernel of corn, and, and bad pollination can make for some poorly filled out corn. Mm -hmm. And you can you can do better with that by just simply the way you plant them for pollination. Plant them in squares, the bigger the better. Uh, one more thing about pollination, I've noticed this uh, going back to the fertilizer. If you got your fertilizer delivered right to your corn, if, if, it's, if it's got enough fertilizer, you, the timing of your tassel development and your silk development will, will, will coincide really nicely. If your fertilizer 
is off a little bit, you'll start tasseling a lot sooner before you have silks and you don't get as good pollination. So yeah. having that right, giving them the right feeding is going to make everything kind of time out right for you. Standard row spacing on corn is 36 inches. Just about everybody does 36 inch row spacing. There's a few people out there to do 30 inch, but I would 30. say you do 30. I've done 30 fine. Oh, you've done 30. Yeah. But the 30 is not your standard. I, I, it just depends on how it works out when I measure off my plot. Sometimes I do 30, sometimes I do 36. 36 is standard for me, and for most of the people out there, that's it. I've done two. People ask me all the time, can I do one or two foot? Nope. I've done two foot before. You get too much foliage, and your yep. pollen can't fall down on them silks. Yep. Uh, just, just don't do it. 30 to 36. I'd recommend 36. Uh, seed spacing along the road. Now this is going to vary a little bit depending on what if you got irrigation, what kind of irrigation you got. You'll see a lot of people that swear you're going to, they're going to put sweet corn every 12 inches. I have got away with before growing as close as four inches apart. Six to eight is probably more ideal for most folks. If you got it on drip, you got a little more leniency there. You can push the limits a little bit more. We always plant ours thick and thin it a little bit. Uh, and sometimes I'll thin mine to six to eight. Sometimes I might leave a few stalks at four. That's if you're growing on drip. If you're using overhead or you got minimal irrigation, 12 inches probably. Yeah, I think eight is probably in a good year, eight is ideal. In a perfect world where everything's wonderful, eight inches is, is the perfect. You definitely don't want to overcrowd it because what's going to happen, you're going to get some spindly stalks. So you make sure, you. I'd rather have it further apart than I had to overcrowd it. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, you, I, want, you want a big old thick stalk. Yeah. I normally, I, I like to go in there and thin mine just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'll plant mine on three, four inches. Just make sure I get oh, yeah, this I thin do too. and then I'll go in there and thin it out a little bit. Uh, irrigation. We talked about irrigation, irrigation, irrigation. Irrigation, irrigation, uh, irrigation. If you can, if it's feasible, I, I promise you, I hear this all the time. People say, I won't ever grow corn without drip tape again. If you ever try it, uh, it'll, blow you, it'll blow your mind. So if you're in a situation where you can't use drip tape, you want to use one of these field corns, one of these open pollinated heirloom varieties, or the silver queen. If you're in that situation where you absolutely can't, pick you one that's gonna be more drought resistant. That way, if you do have adequate rainfall, you still have a good year. If it turns off a little dry, then you've hedged your bets just a little bit, so. Yeah, the problem you have, it, it's not when it's small, but when that corn gets on five or six foot tall, it's hard, even if you got a good overhead sprinkler, it's hard to get it, get, a lot of that water is gonna hit them leaves and evaporate before it can get down that soil. I'll tell you the way I used to do it. And this is aggravating, but I used to have me a 55 gallon barrel. Uh -huh. So when that corn got up and got ready to toss them, that's when it's really important that your corn gets the water it needs is when it's tasseling. I would take that 55 gallon barrel, move it out in the middle of my corn patch, and I'd go out and set my sprinkler on top of it because I got a sprinkler that's, I'm going to fall off this stool. Uh -oh. I got a sprinkler that's four, well, it's just probably five foot tall on a stand. I would take that and put it on top of that barrel. Get way up there. Way up. We're, we're at 2 o'clock in the morning. I know it's time for me to move my sprinkler. So I'd get up, put me a little bit of clothes on. I'd come up there and get in that wet cornfield, move that barrel, and move my sprinkler and turn it back on because I had to water at least six, seven hours to do any good there. That's for the birds, ain't it? It's the way we used to have to do it. We didn't know no better. That's the way you we know what? The way I do it is I walk out there to my garden about 9.30 or 10 o'clock and I go over there and I turn that spigot on and flip the switch for that hose and then I come out there in the morning and I turn it off. With the corn, we let it run all night. Yeah, that's, that's the best way. Okay, irrigation there. Uh, earworms, let's talk about pests a little bit. Uh, now I'll spray some liquid cop on my corn. I, we don't have a huge problem with, with fungus and diseases, but I will mix some lit copper in there just to be safe or some disease control. Uh, the big pest problem on corn is everybody gets worms and want to know how to control the worms. Can I use BT? The evidence out there on BT is a little dicey. Some sites say it works, some say it don't. Uh, spinosad definitely works. There's no yeah. there saying spinosad doesn't work. That's what you need. Get your spinosad. When you, you can spray it, the, the ideal time to spray it with the, or when you really want to be spraying it is when your silks start developing. But I have seen in the past 
If you got worms bad, they'll get up there and they'll gnaw off the tassel and that's going to ruin your pollination. So if you yeah. see some worm damage earlier, like that corn's probably three foot tall. If you can see worms have been eating on the top of that plant. I put some out there on it. You got you to hit them. Now, that yeah. spin sad right before dark. Spray the plant good, and it'll take care of them worms. For some reason or other, I've never figured it out. Some years are worse on corn earworm than others. I have had years where I didn't do anything. I didn't have the first worm. Not been many, but there's been a few. And some years, they just about eat me up. I've gotten to the point the last few years where I scout my corn pretty regularly when it gets up about titty high. And if I start seeing any worm pressure whatsoever, I go ahead and get started spraying, and it's helped me a lot. Uh, doing that. Keep an eye on there. I don't worry a lot about it when it's knee high, but when it gets on up a little bit higher and I start seeing some worms, I get after them because I want to be ahead of the game on those worms. I don't like worms beating up my corn. If you generally have a problem with corn earworms, go ahead and have you some spinosad ready when you need it. Although we ship pretty fast, you don't, the last thing you'll do is a position where your corn's getting eat yeah. up at night and you're waiting on to get some spinosad in the mail. So go ahead and have some ready for you. Last thing, let's talk about fertilization real quick. We mentioned this earlier, and I've got a video out there on this. I'll, I'll, I'll put a, a little thumbnail up at the end of the show. The, the general need of corn, uh, as far as nitrogen goes, is five and a half pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Okay. That means uh, throughout the lifespan of that plant, you want to give it five and a half pounds of nitrogen. You don't want to give it all at one time. You want to kind of spoon feed it. So 10, 10 pounds of Chilean nitrate or 20, 20, 20, something like that is going to give you two pounds of nitrogen. Um, so per thousand square per thousand feet. Square feet. Uh, so uh, you have to factor in what the percentage of nitrogen is on that fertilizer using, but five and a half total pounds of nitrogen and if you, you kind of spread that out in, in three or four applications, uh, you're going to be doing good there. Corn also needs adequate amounts of phosphorus and potassium too, especially phosphorus. It's one of those crops that uses up a lot of phosphorus. Yeah, and that, so, that's why that 20, 20, 20 is important early. Then you can kind of switch over to just some Chilean nitrate and side dress it when you boom. heal it. Uh, we didn't boom. talk about healing corn. Uh, you don't have to heal corn, but it, it keeps the weed pressure down between the rows, stabilizes the stalks so it don't blow over. Uh, it's just a good thing to do. Yeah, I recommend healing corn. All right. I've always done it. <clears throat> Any other questions about corn? Put those in the comments below, and we'll be glad to try to get to them on next week's show. We've got some questions from last week's show, and if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostels.com, and we'll send you a nice little prize. All right, first one is from Edward Dennison. Edward says, what are you looking at to tell when to plant our tomatoes? Low temp, soil temp. I've got a tray of tomatoes ready to go, and I'm scared it's too early in zone 8A. You've got a few of yours in the ground. And get I, them in the ground. And uh, I, I, I'm time permitting, I, I got some to get in the ground too. I, I don't really have like a definite thing. I go out there and check soil temp. It's just kind of a feel thing for me. I just know it's time. I, I know it's time. Now, if I really think hard about it, I can think about some visual cues. Like my mulberry tree starts putting on berries, which is the first thing to kind of produce around my house. Tomatoes need to get in the ground. I, I just, around here, now, I know people up a little north of us, they, they are a little more gun shy because they sometimes have a late frost. But uh, down here, it, you just kind of know when you're done with the frost, that temperatures warm up. And, and we always have extra plants in the greenhouse. And we always grow extra plants because we like to take that chance and we like to plant as early as we can. If we was to lose them, we just go out here and plant them more. Yeah, uh, we have a warm warm spring this year probably a little bit above average last year we had that cold spell come late we ain't raining long. We ain't normally speaking you can plant your tomatoes in zone 8 15th of march and be okay yeah i i say it's always worth taking a chance yeah okay question number two is from ken collins and uh, we should have brought the flat in here. But he says, when will Greg plant his watermelons? I have some in trays that have their first true leaves, so when should I get them in the earth garden? Well, Ken, I, mine's looking pretty good. I'm probably about the same stage you are. I'm starting to put on some true leaves with my sangria watermelons. I got planted in the greenhouse here. I'm thinking I'm about a 
five to seven days out. Now I got, ain't got my drip tape down yet in my place where I'm gonna put them, so I got some work to be done. But I think I'm probably about the middle of next week, I'm gonna get some in the ground. You got a heap of sangria watermelons you're gonna get. I got a year. bunch of sangria watermelons. I'm looking forward to that. I hope, I hope you have a good crop, because I'm looking forward to eating some of them Ooh, things. Ooh, I could eat me a belly full of them right now. <laughs> We said you to just have a show, a show where we just sit here and eat watermelon. Now I can promise y'all, if y'all think y'all love watermelon, you don't love it near as what Greg does. <laughs> That's one of my favorite I, things I, on earth is watermelon. I can attest to that. He, now, he, I don't care nothing about no cantaloupe. Y'all can have your cantaloupes, but I love me some watermelon. You can eat two a day, can't Woo. you? All right. What we got next? All right. So, Travis... The guy, I guess his name is Travis. I wrote my own question. You wrote your own question. You're going yeah, yeah, to you answer your own question. Well, yeah. This is something, something, something. I may start doing that. <laughs> what in the world are all these people talking about? Strings in their beans. Man, so so on my bean plant video of the day, I asked everybody what, what kind of, what varieties of cannon beans, pole beans they like. And everybody's talking about, I like this variety because it don't have a string. String, string, and the bean. Everybody's talking about strings and the beans. Now, I've been eating, growing beans. I pick beans as a young and during the summer, eating canned beans. I ain't never had no problem with any string in the beans. I don't understand what all these people are talking about. Now, I asked a question on one of the, uh, might have been on Row by Row, one of our posts. I know Tom Matthews says that if you let them get real big, then they get this string in them that gets caught in your teeth. Now, mom always, we always pick stuff pretty regular, right every two days. And I guess we just always picked them small before that happened. But I, yeah. somebody can explain this string thing to me because everybody's like, well, I want a stringless variety of bean. I ain't never had any problem with any variety having a string in them. I guess we just pick them early. We do. We normally pick them a little bit younger than the most people. Another thing, too, we don't, a lot of people get the bean out of them. We've never done that. We eat the whole pot. Yeah, and when we pick them growing up, because you get your tail tore up if you didn't, you had to pick them clean now. Woo! Boy, you, mama get upset you don't pick them beans clean. You she pick them clean. To, you pick anything that big or bigger, you pick them clean. You're going to go back and redo it if you didn't do it right. That's right. That's right. Don't matter what time of day it is. Yep. All right. The last one here is uh, from Jeremy Parkerson. And old Jeremy, he stopped by here a few weeks ago, and he's been waiting for a long time to have one of his questions answered on the show and uh, we finally got to him so um jeremy wants to know he has a bad problem with citrons and a lot of people might you might have to give a little background on that people don't know what they are but does they have to worry about them with his watermelons yeah it can be a problem now citrons are a little small watermelon that's native to africa and we've had them around here forever have them a lot of times i don't know if it did it intentionally but it happened it used to be a lot of cow pastures have citrons. Ain't worth the two days. It's a little small. Well, the, you know, livestock like them. So it's good feed for livestock. The inside of the citron is just non edible. It's really white. It's not edible. Now, people in Africa, they can make, they can pickle if the you, rind. If you just hard like, up, you could eat one. It's be tough. <laughs> we view it as a noxious weed, is the way we view it. I mean, anytime you talk about citrons, you talk about that's a weed you don't get rid of. It looks, it is a melon, so it, the vine looks nearly identical to, to a watermelon that you're going to be growing. So definitely you want to get it out of there because it's going to be stealing your, uh, your water, your nutrients, and your sunlight. You do not want them out there. So anytime you see them, plow them, hit them, get them up. If I had one growing out there, I'd take my hoe to it immediately, just like I would a rattlesnake, and I'd get rid of it. So yeah, you want to clean those up. and, uh, and They look good on the outside. Yeah, but you don't want, yeah. you just don't want them. Citrons, native to Africa. Huh? Yep. They eat them over there. They pickle the rinds and things like that. They don't. The, it's not a melon like what we think of watermelon, where you eat the inside. They will actually make products out of the rind and stuff like that. Huh? How about that? Huh? All right. So thank y'all for those questions. Don't forget to send us your address so we can send you a nice little prize, uh, folks. We're gonna keep plugging away here. We're gonna be open as long as we can be open, doing what we need to do so you can grow your own food. We hope everybody yeah, uh, we do. is is having a good garden year and has a good gardening year. Stay safe out there. Enjoy the outdoors. Enjoy what God's given us and the ability to, to get out there and watch some things grow and enjoy every day just like it was your last.
Christ. That's right. And if you enjoyed tonight's show, check out these two videos right here. We got one on the corn fertilization schedule I did last year, kind of uh, giving a little more detail to what we talked about tonight. And another one on how to install our Easy Flow injector, which works great for fertilizing corn. We'll see you guys next week. Take care.